from Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to Leila and Massimo Vignelli, internationally celebrated designers, and there is almost nothing that they haven't designed. Furniture, glassware, flatware, exhibition layouts, books, posters, jewelry, furniture, corporate trademarks, store, showroom, and interior design. The Vignellis are obviously total designers interested in shaping the whole environment. Is there anything that you exclude from your interest? Is there anything that you don't design? If there is a mechanism, I stay away, like typewriter, you know, or a radio, things like that, or a bicycle. Is there anything <laughs> that you haven't designed yet that you'd like to? Well, there are many things for sure, and uh, especially standing from the uh, design for the home to fashion. The you role of fashion is transitory. The role of clothing is permanent. Now, generally speaking, our design, we're more interested in permanence than transitory things, that like feds or fashions. Are you saying that there is a philosophy that unifies all the diverse work that you do, if it is furniture or oh, the yeah. possibility of yeah, clothing? Exactly. Well, the philosophy is based on three points. Discipline, appropriateness, and ambiguity. Discipline, appropriateness, and ambiguity. Okay. I can understand the first two qualities, they seem clear enough, but could you please expand on that last term? What do you mean when you say ambiguity? It's a moment of tension. It's a moment neither there or there, neither here or there. And it's the situation like here I say, here the night. It's a beautiful state of, of mind and it's, it's a terrific one. It's the moment of excitement. It's the moment of creation. And uh, ambiguity is, a, uh, is something which is or uh, not reachable as well, you know, it's undefinable, it's ambiguous. It's in the making. <laughs> it's, it's always there, you know, in the it's, making. Uh, it's terrific, yeah. I love is it. There I like that thing, you see, all the pieces are standing up, and, and one is lying down. Why is lying down? Because by lying down, it has an ambiguous situation. What do you call no. this table, Ed? Nobody has to read that thing, it's, it's important that I know it. Well. <laughs> We call it at the beginning metaphora, but now that is metaphor, metaphor but metaphora in Italian, yes. but uh, where it was first produced, but now that it's distributed in the United States, they say that they won't understand, so they call it Euclid. This was the distributor that is ICF idea. Well, Euclid probably <laughs> is a very good reference to any of your work because there is a very strong geometry mm -hmm. yes, that appears absolutely. to be underlying. Absolutely, and this is again because geometry doesn't go, uh, is not a fed. Geometry is an eternal value, and we really always try to, to have, uh, if you see our design, there is always a very uh, strong geometry. But we don't go in sort of wavy, uh, you know, lines or contours because we believe in that. You've been partners in work and in marriage for a quarter of a century. Why don't you tell us how this team effort that you have now described has coalesced for us, <laughs> how it works and who does what? Well, we both do everything and uh, we discuss everything, you know, together and, uh, and then each one of us has more or less uh, his own it takes over, you know, for the follow-up. But we check continuously, and all Tolela is more involved with three-dimensional things and more involved with graphics. Nevertheless, I'm also involved with three-dimensional things, and Lele is involved with graphics in the sense that we discuss whatever project we are doing. And the attitude has always been, and has a very simple one, if Lele doesn't like it, it goes in the wastebasket. The alliance between the possible Massimo and the practical Leila. And if she says no go, it's into the basket. Oh, sure, it's much faster to do a, a new thing than try to convince her. <laughs> you know, it's very fast with idea. By the idea. Because it's fast, sometimes, you know, they're not they're half baked, so they go in the basket. <laughs> I feel that the most important thing, and it was perhaps not so clear or strong at the beginning, is that now we are really helping each other. We are not anymore out to show who is best, who has first the idea and so on. That sometime years ago, when we were more insecure, it was there. And now, instead, we are out to help each other. Or otherwise, it goes just in a, in a drawer, because that is a terrific idea, but it's not appropriate for this job. How important is it to be aware of the past in terms of design? The past is the best thing that, is, that ever happened. <laughs> in the past, that is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
So you're saying that a total awareness of the past and the well, use of historical reference, that's what I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, Won't yeah, you take yeah. one of these objects and tell us? You know how this came us? about? I tell you, I tell you the story in one second. We had to do these glasses for uh, this company in Venice, you know, the Chigo, the Chigo Hotel. Chigo Hotel. And I was sitting there at the Great Hotel watching the, the, the La Salute, you know, the Church of La Salute which has a, a dome, which is exactly like this, with the ribs and like that. And the president of the company was saying, how our glasses are going to be? Do you have any idea? And I said, just like that, <laughs> exactly like that. It relates to Venice in one side. It's a marvelous shape. And, uh, and then the other thing, which is a lot of fun, by the way, in, in a, with forms, is that a lot of forms, when you turn them upside down, they become something else. Is there a Vignelli look? If I were to walk oh, no. in some place and God I'd forbid. say, well, here is Leila and Massimo, see God their forbid. fine hand it would again. Be the, it would be the negation of all what we stand for. Uh, we, don't want, we don't want to have a look. I think when we have a look, it's because our design is too weak. We are not interested in the personal style. We're not interested even in style, per se, as it's been classified. We are interested in raising the standards of design acceptance. Well, there is obviously a Vignelli attitude. Uh, we've been that, talking that about I like better. Right. That I like better. How would you describe that? Attitude, attitude is a permanent thing. It's, it's a style is a transitory thing. And I have no like for tra transitory things. <laughs> well, up to this point, we've been talking about your background and your philosophy. Why don't we take a moment and talk about your office? How does it work? How many people work with you and what do they do? Oh, it works beautifully. It's terrific. It's 25 <laughs> people working like a lot of fun, and uh, they're very good designers working. We 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 talk with the designer, and uh, Lely and I we talk about the project. We call in the designer. When you say the designer, there are <coughs> graphic designers, graphic and product, and product designers, product designers. Yeah. are there architects? Yes. Mm -hmm. We sort of uh, sometime crossover. You know, we 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 sort of break the idea together and you know with the designer that we feel will be more appropriate to follow up on that uh, particular project and uh, and then generally as massimo was saying before if his graphic is in his field if it's three-dimensional is my field but you yeah. always cross over really there is really and also the designer the the, the great thing is that the people that work with us uh, really learn to cross boundary and even if they are graphic they start to be, be interested in sort of three-dimensional yeah. getting to sign architectural <laughs> signage and so on they learn to have that that more broader point of view and uh, feel of activity. I wonder if you keep an idea file or do you design oh, out of your own need or you work only by commission or assignment? Generally so. is by commission and assignment and uh, when we do something by our own need is because we need it for ourselves you know a pieces for of example. furniture like for example the the sofa that was designed 1964 and the lacquer sofa the Saratoga and is still around Stanley carries it that because we really needed the sofa for our house. <laughs> But I've rarely been in your company, either the two of you, where something did not happen. You said, oh, that's a great idea. And someplace, somewhere, do you write it down, oh, file yeah. it away, yes, and then absolutely. retrieve it? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Has we there have... been a recent example of the use of something from that file that you've applied to a practical and manufacturing yeah, that, basis? Those two, these dishes this here, this one. is exactly, we designed Why originally those. we look at those dishes? That's a new no. Kyoto line of right. lacquerware that you've done. Do you call them, is this um, the clean pile of dirty dishes? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> now <laughs> tell us what that means and tell us how it came out of your file and how you well, translated exactly. it I'll tell you the whole reality. story because uh, it's an amusing story because it goes like that. Uh, you know, when you start to eat a dinner, you have all the tables set up, the candles and the plates and the crystal and flatware and the whole Sounds thing is good. nice, it's terrific. And it's beautiful and you sit down and you start eating, you know, talking, eating and drinking, talking, eating and drinking and gradually you're moving the whole table toward the garbage can, you know, <laughs> and it becomes an awful mess, you know, until you finally, uh, at the end, and since we have no butlers around, so you, you have to do that awful job of, of collecting the dishes and picking up, you know, the, the flatware along with the chicken bones left over and all these things. Don't you know, make it uh, so disgusting. <laughs> no, no, I want to make it disgusting because it is a disgusting thing there. So what you do, you take your flatware, you put it inside there and it stays there. Then you take another dish like this, everything is inside, and you put the one on top of the other. You don't have to get the flatware out. 
you don't have to put your finger on it in other terms. You just make a whole pile of these dishes, then you take one of these dishes, you put it on top of it, and you have a clean pile of dirty dishes, which from that point of view is quite an achievement. Everyone may not know that you are the designers of it, but there's hardly a household regardless of economic range or geographical location, that doesn't have right. some of your plastic tableware that comes in every color rainbow, and every rainbow, color, rainbow right. color, size, and shape. Tell us about the Heller mm -hmm. plastic tableware. When did you first do that? Well, that was done in 1964, and uh, we were doing a corporate identity for a, for a small company which was in the plastic business. And, uh, and one of the partners had another small co uh, company which was making Mickey Mouse uh, ashtrays. Ash when you say Mickey Mouse, that means not too good. No, no, good? with Mickey Mouse. Oh, really, they with added, Mickey Mouse. The license. Just like that. Like that, Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like that, right there. And uh, so I said, well, if you can make that, uh, how about making a, a set of dinnerware which would be stackable, very compact and you know nice and things like that. And maybe we can win a nice design award. And so I immediately had the idea that that could have been a good uh, possibility and, and uh, just went back to the office and a half an hour later it we had the whole It was very drawing. fast. And very he fast. came out in production, you know, yeah, like a few in months. A month we got the award, by the way. Incredible. <laughs> got, got the golden compass. You also got a lot of imitations of that. But everything. That's the only, you know, sad thing in one side. I mean, financially, it's a sad thing because they preempt your own market. On well, the what other about side, don't you patent I said your before, designs? This, we, if no, you want to do, raise the standard, but that's at that the point, first thing we, you did, have to we, we didn't know really enough and we didn't patent it. All of the things that we're looking at the decanter, the two glasses, and the flatware. Were those all done for commercial versus, you know, residential purposes? <coughs> this and how do you make yeah. the distinction? Why couldn't well, anyone were, use that at home? Well, uh, no, as a matter of fact, it's the same thing. Uh, these were designed originally for the Chi hotels because we designed the whole corporate identity. Then they asked to design china, glass, and silverware, which we keep doing. This, by the way, is usually the story. You know? And then we say, by the way, your office needs a little, you know, redoing here. And then, then they say, well, you have done my office. How about doing my apartment? And it's so, okay, don't do no, that. No, the apartment but, was no, but, you know, We don't it, do that. It, you know, it keeps but going the on. The and things like but that. But anyhow, uh, the. This flatware was done for them, and so everything relates to, to this team of, you know, these lines. But I, now they, they're also available on the market for, not for a... Uh, not for hotel use, but for, for, hotel for use, private but, use. You know, for private use. Are you admiring your work? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Other than your own apartment, are there any, are there any no. interiors that you do? Not for private. Why uh, not? Because too again, it's, it's too diff it's too you get too personalized. It's too difficult. It's too time consuming. Cost interior, too much money. interior can be terribly time consuming. So you know, it, we we selected to do it just uh, for. Uh, companies or institutions, and as a matter of fact, we like more um, institutions like uh, museums and the church was, was one of our best jobs. Did you ever do a house? Yeah, I did a house when I was uh, in school, and I too much work and decided that, that was not as much fun as graphics and design, which is quick. And you can see right away if it comes out right or wrong. Well, you you know, like a, house you have, a house you have to wait the whole time to get constructed. And then if it's wrong, you've got to find another client to, you know, to build another house, which is going to take another long time before you learn. The <laughs> How business. do you find your clients? Well, they can buy themselves, thank God. You know, that's no problem. <laughs> that's, 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 that's easy. Well, I wonder if you would describe for us how you live. What does the interior of your own apartment look like? Well, I will say that it's very spare. As a matter of fact, I had people coming in and saying, long, long time ago, but the lady came in and said, well, I understand you will like a few more things around, won't you? <laughs> And I was so taken back by her not understanding that I didn't even dare to say no. I said, oh, yes, yes, <laughs> naturally. Well, you are generally more straightforward. Why do you want it to look the way it does? Well, first thing, because all the things that are around should be perfect. So, you know, we just 
buy the few things that we can afford at the time or our design and all these kind of things and also and we're, not, we're not collectibles too. Right, we are not collectors. Because you can't collect, I mean collect junk is just taking too much room. To collect good things takes too much money, so we are caught in between, we can do it. Like what are the most dramatic changes that you've observed in the 20 years since your design office opened here? Well I think it's the improvement is sensational. 15 years ago when we came over here, everything was just ugly. Everything. It's unbelievable. There was another good chair on the market beside Nolan Miller chairs, you know, or antique chair, of course. But, uh, and then it was like that for many times. All the, the only good things were imported from Europe. Uh, now, well, I guess there was a time there that we yeah. were beginning to think that Italy was the design center of the world. Right, fine. Right. But, uh, but that uh, doesn't but any now, longer seem to be the case. No, this is terrific. Now you, you have places like Conran, you have places like the Pottery Barn, you have places like uh, Habitat. Th these places didn't exist 15 years ago. Now it's an explosion of, of good things at affordable prices, which is, really is the most important thing. How does that affect tells you your that work? Young people do not want to live with the same junk that previous generation wanted to. That's that encouraging. To be, of course, thank God we did something. You know, I think we all did something. Not, not only ourselves, but, you know, uh, we have been preaching design. Uh, really, that is the thing we have done for the last 25 years. Well, here comes a heavy question, if I may. I mean, you're very philosophical. You're informed by the past. You talk about, uh, you know, raising a standard. In the end, and I really do mean this question, can good design really improve society? Is it an act that has real social meaning or is it more a question of designing pretty things, beautiful things, for people yeah. who can afford to pay for them or even for those who have lots of great taste question. and Terrific lesser fun? Right. I love it. That was amazing. <laughs> I love it. Good, great question. Right. <laughs> I, must tell, <coughs> I must tell you that uh, 15 years ago I really was very convinced that you can transform or at least help to transform the society with good design. I know now that good design does not transform society. The only thing which transforms society is our economical powers. Fine, uh, we all agree about that. Nevertheless, design could make your microenvironment to look much better than what it looks now. And uh, the architect takes care of the microenvironment, the, the politician takes care of this country, which is the super microenvironment. Wait a minute, and I'm just uh, Which was the micro and which was the macro? Well, the, 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 the politician takes care of the nation, that's the super macro. The planners and the architect take care of the macro environment, the region and the city. And when are we responsible and we for take ourselves? Take care of the micro environment. <laughs> what you know, is inside the that house? <laughs> 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 you know, and we take care of the micro environment. But I think that the micro environment is the one which is all around us, all the time, until we go out on the street. But uh, all around us, we're continuously surrounded by furniture, object, desk, pens, everything. You know, things like that. And, uh, and that is the micro environment. It, that's you know, generally speaking, the quality of that, uh, the microenvironment was terrible before, and now it's getting much better, you know. Uh, well, somebody gave me the other day, uh, look, this is a Tiffany coming out. This is an Elsa Peretti uh, design, beautiful, simple, great gesture with that clip. It's not the kind of design that I would design, but it's an object that which I enjoy. It's, it's, it's fine. Now, these things were not available 15 years ago. Uh, How yeah. do you compare the state of Italian design and American design nowadays? In a sense, here is the future of design because more and more companies are beginning to call on designers that years ago they were not doing. And, uh, you know, the, the, the situation naturally is much bigger and it will take a longer time for complete the circle, as in a sense it did in Italy. Looking back, do you think your career would have been any different if you had remained in Italy rather than coming here? And I'm specifically asking you that not only as someone who came from Italy, but as a woman as well. Well, in a sense, my career would have been uh, faster in Italy because for a professional woman there was immediate recognition. There was no difference between a woman or a man, not even the fact of considering the problem. Instead here, there was. 
Was it because there were so many fewer professional fewer women? Fewer professional in women and more, yes, exactly, in Italy. And so if you became professional, there was just no question. Here instead, there was only question you were a woman. And there was really a different uh, way of, of treating you that went on for quite a long time. And now, and 20 now years later? No, no, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, perhaps I conquer also that position personally of not being, you know, intimidated by certain situations or by certain attitudes. Um, so in a sense, uh, I will say that there it would have been faster, recognized faster also and gone to the point. But certainly it would have been on a smaller scale. And, and the, the great thing about uh, working here is really the sense of scale and the sense of power that you get. And also the sense of security, because in, uh, in Italy they go very fast, but then again, you know, there's, it's the country of prototypes. So you have a lot of prototypes, you have the na your name all over the place, but then very few things. Here it takes a longer time, but you are building more on a solid ground, I would think. You know, the syndrome of the big number, <laughs> the only thing which you can easily produce in great quantities is junk. It's amazing. And, uh, and, uh, is that necessarily the no, case? No, it's not really true. Earlier. Not really but true. the point is this, that the, here the industry is addressing to a, a, a nation which is 200 million people. So unless they, they get the whole market, they are not interested in doing. Now, which is the wrong thing, because even a segment of 10% of that, you know, uh, population, 10% right? of that market is bigger than any European market put together. So, uh, you see, it's, it's a matter of attitude. So what do you see as the future direction and emphasis of your work? more uh, designing furniture and product really sort of uh, uh, definitely because also as i see the moment is that uh, in 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 this country the uh, manufacturer are becoming more aware of the design and more aware of the need of the designer so i hope you know that that will be a natural uh, direction in a sense one of your assignments was to design the furnishing for the St. Peter's Church. I guess it's the only condominium church in the country and it's that sort of giant paperweight tucked into the City Court building in New York City. How did that assignment come about and would you tell us what materials you used and what you intended to create and what you did create for the interior of that church. They call and uh, they say, we'd like you to design the interior of St. Peter. And of course I say, well, it was about time. I, say, I was thinking, well, I'm wrong. <laughs> and then I find out what it was, so we got from there. <laughs> But, but, you, but you know, one of the things is also that uh, we immediately started with this uh, interior committee and the pastor, which was a really pastor Peterson, incre pastor terrific Peterson, guy. incredible person. Terrific. And uh, we no, many times say... I have say to tell you one thing right away, because otherwise I forget. You see, there are plenty of good designers in, in the world, but there are very few good clients. Right, very exactly. few. And that was one of the few. You see, Pastor Peterson. What is an ideal client? A client which has understanding <laughs> to begin with, a client which is no, has no fear. And a client and a class, in that case that he doesn't ask you, ideas. have you designed churches before? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You never ask that. Didn't ask that, that never question, asked. you know. <laughs> What did you do for Well, uh, you, you know, we, we uh, first thing, the, the team was very interesting because it was not just a church, but, a, you know, a, a really a meeting hall and a concert hall. And so and it had the to jazz ministry, right, too. The jazz ministry. This, uh, so it had to accomplish yeah. all this. Uh, matter of fact, when we were trying, you know, talking with them and trying to define what this space should be, since it was not a religious space, really, finally we came up with the definition that it should be a moral space, <laughs> which was a perfect definition of what that space should be. What is a moral space? Did well, in that particular case, because of the flexibility of use, it, uh, we didn't want to smell of incense all the time because it would have been kind of out of place for a concert or for a ballet or for a theater. Um, and we, we didn't want it to look too much like a theater because it would have been kind of a, out of place for a funeral or for a wedding or whatever it is or for a service. So it had to be a very ambiguous, very flexible kind of place. The only thing which we had could have been common 
is a certain moral quality about the space and the materials and the honesty and the integrity, <coughs> you know, and the integrity of, of the What did you do for the Now that, 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 that Leila one time explained what we intended for moral space I said just the opposite of a catering palace <laughs> just, <you know. laughs> Well what did you do for that interior? What are the materials that you well, used? Well the materials naturally are sort of noble and, noble and long lasting like granite and solid oak and uh, a very uh, thick strong natural linen and uh, the wool that they use you know for the petty point and um, um, so you know the, the materials really the, the, we, we choose also to use uh, solid oak and not uh, veneer because we really wanted to have the thing long lasting and heavy as the pews of the you know traditional churches we choose also to go to the pews because we didn't want to have the forest of legs of the of the chairs and we wanted also so to the define pew goes to the uh, floor the right to define architecturally you know the the space occupied by the sitting units as in like the in new colonial church, new yeah. england churches you know that they have those uh, sort of boxes and then also on the, all the steps that are around the church that are architectural steps really part of the architecture when they are closed, they open up and they become a seat because again, we didn't want to have to see that uh, sea of empty seats when there is few people in the church. Very depressing. And An then the church. other <laughs> thing that is particular to that is that all the, there is a lot of modular uh, platform and steps to form uh, the elevation of the altar that can be moved all around in a different position from the center to one side to the other side to change completely from a central church to a long nave uh, church. And uh, so no everything has a no. sort of a very um, permanent and uh, look, but instead is designed, so it is uh, uh, modular and, mob and mobile. In this moral space, why are there no crosses? Well, there are no crosses again because uh, the flexibility of use. You don't want to be obsessed all the time by, by, by a cross there, but on the contrary, it, this becomes uh, a very interesting uh, uh, part, of, part the of the ceremony. For instance, the when the whole procession of you know uh, at the beginning of the service comes, you know, the clergy you know. comes comes out before the service. They come and they plant the cross on the platform of the altar, bam, like that. You know, <laughs> and in that moment, that space becomes a church, and only in that moment, just like a, a forest becomes a forest in Elizabethan theater when you go with just the one plant. You if see, I may, it's that power of image. That is beautiful. I was noticing the beautiful necklace that you're wearing, Leila. Is that something that either of the two of you designed? Yes, it's one of my design because I really wanted the necklace. <laughs> and speaking of designs, I noticed recently, Massimo, you have redesigned yourself. Oh yeah, it became 50, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you were wearing a whole other kind of attire, yeah, well, a different it, kind of suit that had no lapels yeah, and right, so on. Right, what right. made you change your mind? Uh, age. <laughs> age and the fear of becoming ridiculous and stabilized, you know, in a, and trapped in one own cliche. Well, yes. that is something that no one would ever, ever suspect will happen to you. <laughs> Thank you, Leila and Massimo Vignelli, for being with us today. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom.